Good morning, I'm Marcus Lay, Battalion Chief in charge of training Eugene Springfield Fire. It's June 1st. Uh, welcome from wherever you're watching. This is uh, a blue card series for our department. Uh, this will be in place of B Shifter continuing education. This will be just uh, content based on our policies and procedures best practice with uh, blue card nomenclature. Uh, hopefully you've watched some of the other videos, including the strip mall and, and other content we put out on high rise. Uh, we're going to be going over uh, first arriving company officer duties uh, on this one. We'll be talking about big box stores, such as, and we'll be using Jerry's Home Improvement, which is a large uh, hardware store in our first two areas. Uh, good morning. My name is Dan Giles. I'm one of the training captains here. Oh, Dan Giles. I'm Ed. Ed Meyer. Uh, one of the training <laughs> captains here. Uh, so this is a. We're putting together some uh, our blue card training, um, trying to do replacing the continuing education modules. Does he need to do that over? Because I, I was on laughing purpose. on camera. <laughs> I did it on purpose. You did? <laughs> yeah, of course. Oh. I, 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 listen. I, I looked you, at you. You were like deadpan. <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah, and I forgot my name. <laughs> well, I don't know. All right. Uh, so yeah, we're doing the continuing education, uh, replacing the uh, online blue card with our own content um, so uh, we're going to be doing we're going to discuss uh, now uh, Jerry's home improvement and a couple different fire conditions um, the pictures I have uh, are just from the front of this but uh, I think that's just kind of relevant because I want to talk about the dangers of fires inside giant occupancies like this uh, and when we're going to go kind of talk about offensive, defensive, go, no go strategies that we have and kind of get your thoughts on that and my having zero experience with it, just what I've been reading and things uh, associated with that. I think that's an important topic to discuss. Right. And uh, we haven't talked about this in all of our videos, but we'll talk about, you know, alarm assignments and when to strike alarm assignments and, and how to stage and, and um, you know, just kind of best practice there. Again, the intent is that everybody in the department you know, take in this content, and even though you may not do it exactly how myself or Captain Meyer might do it, uh, re review the policies and have the conversations at the at the dinner and breakfast tables about how we're going to fight these fires, why the captains are going to make these decisions, why the battalion chiefs are going to make these decisions, and and um, so we can kind of get to the same place on these. Right. So yeah, let's go to uh, let's go to the first. Uh, picture of the, the occupancy. All right, so uh, I'll, I'll give the, uh, the initial size up on this one, see if I can screw this one up like I did the last one. Uh, Farcom 2, Tower 3. Tower 3's arrived at Jerry's with a working fire uh, coming from the lumber sales side. Uh, we're going to be in the offensive strategy with an attack line to the interior for primary search and fire control. Uh, Tower 3 will be Jerry's command. Give me a second alarm. So this looks like to me, let's talk about what the smoke looks like. It's whitish smoke. Uh, it's not super angry. Um, it looks like it's coming from somewhere close, possibly close to the building. You can't really see it, but there's no other smoke coming out of the building. So yeah. I would commit to this, although Tower 3 doesn't have a... Uh, <laughs> doesn't have a hose line, so uh, but we still be we still still be in the offensive strategy on this one with the next in, engine company. What is that right. going to look like? So your assignment to this should be a five and two uh, because it's a commercial structure. It's over the square footage. Uh, it's we can just call you know when we talk about the nomenclature of blue card we talk about small, medium, large, mega. Right. And so and that really talks to us about of course building size, but also how much hose we're going to need to reach right. or how far we can reach with our standard inch and three quarter pre-connect, right? Right. So, uh, but when we're talking about our Lowe's, our Home Depot's, our Costco's, our Jerry's Home Improvement, let's just call them what they are. Right. Uh, there's, there's no need to describe the building that there's not a person who, you know, actually lives in the community, doesn't know what they look like. So, uh, Company officers should be confirming in route, did I get a five and two? Okay. Um, and we're really good at that. All the company officers are really good at checking their alarm assignment. Uh, battalion chiefs also, did I get a five and two? Did it make sense? Um, it, in this particular instance, it's good that uh, Captain Meyer chose this and arrived as Tower 3 because we do have instances where sometimes Tower 3 is included as one of the engines in the assignment. 
So let's make sure that we actually got two trucks and uh, like, like we were supposed to and all the engines that we were supposed and to And you get. can tell I've uh, not worked the truck because all my practiced <laughs> uh, size ups have been with an engine company. It's still going to be the same assignment effectively. It's just not going to be your hose line. Your actions are going to be different uh, and how you assign that is going to be different. So the other piece is, uh, you know, consideration for both the first two company officer and the first arriving battalion chief is based on order of arrival. Tower three may be pushed into tactics and strategy that eliminate them from truck work because they were the first ones there. And by the time the battalion chief gets there, um, Tower 3, by just the situation forced upon them, has had to staff a hose line or do something that takes them out of truck assignment. Right. So consider just go ahead and calling for that additional truck. Also on this, immediately with a working fire, and, and it, no matter what this is, even if this is like a, a barbecue out front, I would call for a, you know, a second alarm on this because just of just because of the hazard. So it's super dangerous, uh, super dangerous fires these can be. I mean, these are like, I, I, I think of the bowling alley on Willamette that they were trying to, they had to go deep to try to find the seat of the fire and it was clear on the, on the Bravo Charlie corner, it was the origin of the fire. They went in to try to find it and stretching the long distance hose line with, when you have a giant space like this with a, a, a massive amount of potential um, fuel in the form of uh, unburned smoke in the ceiling and you're trying to go find that seat of that fire that's you can get locked in there really quick and all of a sudden conditions change and you're in real trouble so when i look at these buildings i am going to make sure i can see where the fire is now there's going to be smoke there's going to be there, there's going to be some cold smoke on this because there's going to be sprinklers going yeah. so if you can get if it's really it's right next to that door it's going to be easy to find find the fire and put it out versus trying to get in there to find the seat of the fire. If it's a large, something like carpets burning, then you're in trouble, I think. Yeah, so this is, this is obviously a daylight fire. This uh, Jerry's Home Improvement is open for business. And so most people probably self-evacuated, but it is a large enough structure that you could have people in this structure who still haven't left. You could have people in there that are still doing their shopping. And so that is a consideration here is that we confirm evacuation Oh, and we may have to assist with that. Consider law enforcement to help with that. Um, don't send employees back in. Um, contact an RP and try and get the best idea of what's on fire here. Um, you know, somebody that saw what happened, there's a good chance if you have something like this going on in the middle of the day that you have, you have at least employees injured because they tried to fight the fire. So remember, that's going to be a consideration. And they'll tell you, sorry to interrupt, but I just thought of it. They will tell you where the fire is. They say yeah. it's in this right. area. They'll know where it is. So Captain Meyer's absolutely right. If I can't, it, it, I, I'm going to be very hesitant to start stretching like horizontal standpipes with a two and a half through this building unless I have a very confined fire like in a trash compactor or something. Right that is not a structure fire, it's isolated, and I just know that I, I need that to, to get there. Um, I'm not sure on this building, but I do believe that they have hose cabinets, so I believe that there is a standpipe here. Yeah, so yeah. so uh, large, large fuel loads in here, it's potentially gonna overrun our sprinkler systems, even though you know they're, they're probably following code. Um, That's, that was one thing that I would, I, really consider supporting early is uh, sprinkler. Right. Something this small-ish uh, that may keep it f at bay for a long time, basically keep it controlled for a long time if you can get that supported. Right. Uh, so that would be an early consideration to make sure we're doing that uh, in the alarm assignments for the So and I have seen this happen in uh, jurisdictions before. Do not, do not turn off your sprinkler systems. Uh, right. um, you know, support your sprinkler systems. Don't turn them off. It is, it is not a firefighter firefighting tactic to turn off your sprinkler systems. Um, I mean, it has to be very, very specific. specific. Uh, you know, we're, we're flooding an area where we can't move a person out of and that they're at risk of drowning or something crazy like that. There's not, uh, you know, if you're worried about electrical hazard, get the power shut off, but don't right. turn your sprinklers off. That's interesting because I do, I have had that discussion with people and you turn off sprinklers to minimize damage. 
you, that you leave them going to support the firefighting right. effort. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's I mean, why we shut is, them off. There is a time to shut your yes. sprinklers off, but that's after you have a, a hose line at the, at the seat of your fire and you've confirmed that your fire is knocked down and you, know, you're, you're, you have the fire well under control. Right. Um, so just, that may seem super obvious, but I just, wanna, I just wanna say it, support your sprinkler system early and continue to support it. Don't shut it off on a big box fire like this. Um, so another piece on this, and we're gonna see a fire in occupancy like this, most likely after hours. Right. Um, you know, something has gone awry in their, their storage, a product has acted in a way it wasn't supposed to, and um, so we're gonna be dealing with this most likely after hours and in the dark. Um, big box stores like this, you have lots of points of entry, and so battalion chief's consideration you need to get lots of help there really quick because this is gonna be a division and group fire. Right. And you're going to have potentially multiple points of entry. So control your points of entry and keep track right. because accountability is gonna be really important here. For crews and company officers, it is important that you have an assignment and that you follow the assignment for accountability's sake. It is really easy because geographically you're so separated here to, de to see something that needs to be done and just go do it. But if it puts you in the ideal age or it puts you in harm's way, you've got to report these things so we can track them. And we know that I know that I have a, 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 an engine company that's not under a division manager on the Charlie side that is making entry to an alarm panel or to a sprinkler standpipe room or something like that. I need to know all of those things. Do, don't act without communicating it or, or having an order. Yeah, and there's gonna, the company officers are going to be the uh, division and group supervisors on this one they're going to be the ones many ultimately because we only have three chiefs and we're going to likely you're going to have a group or a division that's going to be assigned to a company officer yeah. talking about that talking about multiple entries that's one of the things that you're for me to consider making an offensive attack on this you've got to find out the best way to get there so you're not stretching that horizontal I, to me i i don't know that i will ever assign or make that as a as a as a tactic again where I've never done it, but I'm making that uh, like doing a horizontal standpipe, trying to stretch a dry line of, uh, of two and a half to go find the seat of the fire in a giant occupancy like this, I think is a bad idea typically. No, and I think that the best place for a horizontal standpipe or laying a two and a half and then, and then gating off of that is exterior. So right. if you have a setback in an occupancy, you're only able to, you know, say for some reason you couldn't get within 200 feet of this front door, then you're doing that sort of thing. But doing that interior in an IDLH is uh, a bad idea. Right, right. It's not, I mean, it, you have to, it has to be very well thought out. If you get down to that tactic, you're like, okay, this is what we need to do, then a very concerted conversation needs to happen of how that's gonna be done. So not to get too, I, hopefully this isn't too remedial, but what we're talking about is there's a fire load that's going. It's filling the, 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 the ceiling with superheated gases. It's going to keep going. It's going to spread and uh, spread out vertically, horizontally, sorry. It's going to spread out horizontally, and then it's going to feel like the conditions are just fine. And then as it continues to build, and if we can't find the seat of the fire, um, those gases can then get hot enough that they will flash, come down on you, and then you kill yourself. So that's, that's what we're not wanting to do. That's what we're talking about, not going in too deep and not going too far, because that's just allowing for the time uh, for the fire to come and, and become extremely dangerous and, and uh, flash, on the, uh, flash on us. So let's talk a little bit about truck, com truck company assignment here uh, and building construction. So yeah. we'll start with building construction. This is a concrete tilt-up. Tilt-up, yeah. Um, so, uh, just a real quick refresher, building construction refresher. Uh, these walls were poured on the ground in place where this building is right now. Uh, they, they were, uh, once they hardened, they were tilted up in place. They were supported until the ceiling or the, the trusses were connected to them. And so really it's an interlocked building. These, these walls here are big concrete plates and uh, until they got the trusses set in place, there were uh, steel, steel trusses holding them up. And so, so that roof structure is integral to those plates being up where they're at. Uh, if, that, if those trusses start to fail, they will either push those plates out or pull them in. So it's not, and now let me ask you this, I don't think that those web trusses, it's gonna be web truss ceiling, 
I don't think those are going to go the full distance. I think they're going to be split halfway. I think they run a wall through the middle, steel beam to the middle and attach them, or is it going to run the entire, this is going to be giant, giant. Yeah, no, they'll be tied together. It won't be one solid truss, but they will be probably bolted together. And on something like Jerry's, as you walk Alpha side to Charlie side, you'll probably see three, probably three um, lines of steel posts that go up right. to like a curtain wall that's in the attic. You'll see if you look up next time you're in Jerry's or Costco, you walk by a steel beam and you look up and there's a line of them that go clear across the store. The trusses rest on top of that. And then um, coming from the ceiling down, you'll see like a, an eight or 16 foot solid wall of, of sheetrock that comes from the, from the ceiling down. And that is to stop the spread of those superheated gases that Captain Meyer was just talking about making it across the store. It'll be compartmentalized and in this one it'll be maybe 12 different sections yeah. possibly yeah, yeah that makes sense and and then a lot of times you will see uh, skylights that actually have a yeah. fusible link that's spring loaded on them and so if the superheated gases get into that skylight if it doesn't melt the skylight it'll melt the fusible link and those will spring loaded pop open and start letting that superheated gas out right. so this is where yeah um, so another thing to remember is that as we look at the front of the store that parapet um, wall that you see going to the top of the horizon there, if you step over the top of that, depending on where you're on the roof, because it's probably slanted from the center out to the uh, Bravo and Delta sides, right. um, if you're in the center of the store, it might be a four foot step down on the parapet. If you're on the Bravo or Delta side of the store oh. and you step over that parapet, it might be eight feet, right? So truck company is going to the roof on something like this. We're going to be looking at dead loads on the roof. So Massive amounts of dead yeah, loads so, on this thing. So considerations for truck companies, you're going to see large air handlers up here. Usually that force, that ceiling or roof structure is reinforced underneath by extra steel posts. Mm -hmm. um, membrane. Yep. Yeah, it's going to be a membrane roof, uh, lightweight over the top of probably five eighths. Uh, real ply. Real plywood. Yeah. Real plywood. Mm -hmm. Um, so truck companies are going to, if we don't have those skylights that are releasing that, um, a really good tactic if we can localize and, and pinpoint the fire is to ventilate right over the top of that fire right, right. and get, get that chimney going up. But it is a really risky uh, procedure for a truck company because you have to locate your fire. You're going to be doing inspection holes as you walk through. Hopefully, uh, a battalion chief is going to be able to give a you know pinpoint within a 40-foot radius of where they need to uh, to ventilate, and then even then we're not going to be able to ventilate maybe right over the fire. We may have to get out to the edge of it because I because it's it even though this isn't strictly panelized, um, you can be eight feet away from a weakened structure and still be on unstable roof. So. Um, so consideration there, this would also be a structure where I would want our truck companies to soften the building if it was after hours, which would mean probably forcing our, our electric doors and things like that and just getting them to a place to where they could be pushed open later, but keep them in the closed position for flow path. Yeah, flow path considerations on that. So another kind of going back to the beginning on this, this is a modern building that's done, it's, that's designed not to be completely involved and, and go to the ground. It's designed for fire safety. So the sprinklers, unless it's an overwhelming amount of fuel, like the petroleum based, like I, I think of rolls of carpet, somebody maliciously setting those on fire and getting it going. Outside of that, this is going to be likely gonna be sprinkler controlled so we can kind of slow down and not take high risks. Uh, right. I'm making the attack. Yeah, I and mean, going back to the go no go conversation, our life risk is low here. So uh, we're talking about the other impacts, impacts to the community, the employees, the mm -hmm. the business's ability to reopen, and so as we consider that, um, you know that that should kind of direct the amount of risk that we take. Um, so right. So the purpose of this slide is to show, you know, you do your best, but to show that. The fire is in the middle of this building. It's already vented through, and we've got heavy, dark smoke coming out of this entrance. So um, this is 
now going to be a much more much more dangerous fire because that's overwhelming the sprinklers and at this point we've got to figure out what we're going to do this is early on likely going to be defensive i don't know i haven't shown much of this but you saw that i don't know if anybody saw the video that walmart distribution center that went up right um and this is this when they, something gets this big and it gets this involved um we're I mean, what are your thoughts, Chief? I'm, I, I'm not, I don't think I'm going into so this. So let's talk about, <laughs> yeah, so um, I, have, I have no, there's nothing here that says I need to send uh, one of our firefighters through a door with a hose line. Uh, they don't, the, the conditions are horrible. There's, there's, you can, I can tell by looking at that alpha side that there's no visibility. And we have probably every bit of a 300 foot stretch to get to just the fire that I can see venting through right. the roof. For that fire to be venting through the roof means that I have a whole section of roof that's unstable. Um, and so uh, this is a defensive fire. And I have a narrow window where I can put uh, engine companies on the ground, on the alpha side, uh, Bravo, Charlie, at large holes, bay doors, getting those open. So, so considerations here for truck companies, engine companies, and battalion chiefs is if we have a fire even before this, if we looked at our last slide, which we don't have to go back okay. to, but uh, um, that was not an incipient fire. It was beyond an incipient fire, but it would look like something we could get a hold of, but we don't know that. So make sure that you leave space on your corners for your trucks to set up. Um, they need to have that space even if it's just a, a trash can fire because a trash can fire can turn into something else. Uh, because if we get to this point, I have a limited amount of time to put companies on the ground underneath our parapets and in our doors near our concrete tilt up with ground monitors okay. to try and get water into the seat of that fire, which uh, frequently won't work because of the warehouse racking that we have in okay. these occupancies. It's, it's unlikely that we're gonna reach the seat of the fire. So pretty soon we're gonna be going um, vertical with our aerials and doing elevated master streams down on this. Right. Um, and then we have to, um, so a consideration, another consideration, even if you're an engine company and you spot on something like this, is that you need to create a setback for you or we're going to need to move your engine right. because those concrete tilt-ups are going to come in or out and they're 35 feet tall, right. so you need to be probably 60 feet away from the structure. Right, right. Right, and, and the also special like sing, special resource requests. If we don't have the ladders there, we'll have to ask for ladder ladder eleven and ladder six uh, specifically to support also as well as the, as well as the truck companies. Yeah, and we're just going to add in here real quick just uh, a couple of, of YouTube clips from concrete tilt ups collapsing. Okay, so defensive fire on this, uh, and this is going to be an all-day project. Tons of uh, onlookers and uh, um, news. So we get the PIO, which is you, and you're going to get your face on camera uh, again. And uh, we'll be talking about this kind of stuff. That's a, another consideration um, for the long-term. Excuse me, the long-term um, prognosis of this thing. And we just have to remember that this is a prominent business in the in the community. And I mean, I just think about the impact to my personal life if a home improvement store, because you know I'm constantly doing stuff. I mean, this is an impact uh, community wide. So uh, that doesn't that doesn't raise itself to the level of us putting ourselves at undue risk to put this fire out. But understand as we're operating in this area and and taking care of this fire that the community is how the community is viewing this um, and probably another consideration for you know, more likely battalion chiefs as we're looking at a large defensive fire like this 
is what is the time of year? Um, do we, you know, are we in late August where we have red flag conditions? Do we need to start thinking about having, um, like on the Swanson Mill fire, uh -huh. uh, patrols that are downwind that are looking in grassy fields? And do we need to consider uh, looking at um, water system maps and pulling hydrants off of separate different loops. Right. Um, There's hydrants all over this parking lot. Right. But yeah, you wonder what, what, what's feeding it. Yeah, right. so you know, we can always get Springfield Public Works there. I believe, is this a, the Springfield yes. Jerry's? Yes. Um, get Springfield Public Works there, get a map of the, uh, you know, from sub of the water system and, and um, you know, something like this is where we're gonna have to start worrying about and thinking about water supply. Perfect. Um, so talk about this with your crews. Uh, there's a lot of material uncovered here. I'm sure that we, I stepped past some points that people are like, oh, what about this? What about that? Those are the conversations that you guys should be having in the station right now. Like, oh, Chief Lay forgot about this, or Captain Meyer forgot about that, or. Um, <laughs> Nobody uh, would say anything. No, 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 that, that would be uncommon. <laughs> but, but really, I want you guys to talk about this and how you would do it, and uh, really just to, to to make sure that we're keeping this in the forefront of our mind. Right. All right, well, that's a big box.